Addiction is one of the most poorly understood things on the planet. Should I say, misunderstood. Most people point towards a thing that somebody's addicted to as if it is the original cause of the addiction itself. That's a little bit like seeing flies on a pile of garbage and thinking that the flies created that pile of garbage. Every single addiction is in fact a coping mechanism. Engaging in that addiction provides some form of specific relief. To cope is to make a specific alteration mentally, emotionally, or physically so that you can manage or adapt to something that is causing you distress. A coping mechanism is a specific procedure, process, or technique, or thing, which manages to create adaptation to distress. Stress is serious business. A person cannot thrive in an atmosphere of stress, so it only makes sense that when we experience distressing situations, we would instantaneously want to make a change to it. However, that's the thing. When we can't make a change to something, or think we can't make a change to something, then we're forced to cope with it. This is especially true in childhood, when we did not call the shots about our own life. The people around us did. To learn more about this, watch my video titled How to Let Go of a Coping Mechanism. To understand addiction, I have a few analogies. I want you to imagine that somebody has a very deep wound, but in their current circumstances, there's no real way to focus on healing that wound, or at least the person believes there isn't. So what they have to do is to find some way to mitigate the pain that that wound is causing in their life. This is what addiction is. Here's another analogy. I want you to imagine that somebody's stuck in a very, very deep hole, and they believe that it's not possible to get out of that hole. An addiction to whatever it is they're addicted to is like wings that attach to the person temporarily and fly up out of that hole, but they can't go sideways so as to completely alleviate the problem. Instead, it allows somebody to hover right outside of that hole for as long as a person is feeling relief from that addiction they're engaged in, and then they go back into the hole. It is, in essence, self-administered pain medication. We will be looking for a physiological variable that dictates why some people get addicted and why some people don't for the length of a Bible before we realize that the real variable in the situation is what emotional and mental wounding a person experienced that is causing them to feel relief when they engage in a particular behavior or take a particular substance. Specific variables in terms of what type of pain people experience and thus what they need relief from dictates very clearly what somebody will actually become addicted to. So that you can understand what I mean, I have a few examples. People who experienced a serious rejection and whom internalized the negativity projected at them from the person who rejected them tend to become hypercritical of themselves. They experience self-hate. They would have more of a tendency to become addicted to cutting or bulimia. A person who feels empty and powerless to getting the kind of emotional needs they need from others might have more of a tendency to become addicted to S&M porn. A person who is terrified of their own emotions because those emotions have never been validated or resolved and who has been taught that the only acceptable behavior is emotional suppression might have more of a tendency to become addicted to meditation. A person who feels unsafe to be themselves in relationships and therefore feels they constantly have to live in a state of pretense might have more of a tendency to become addicted to alcohol. A person whose nervous system is constantly on high alert and because of the pain and distress in their life, they're feeling constant anxiety, would have more of a tendency to become addicted to opiates. Um, conversely, somebody who deals with extreme levels of powerlessness that puts them into a state of apathy may have more of a tendency to become addicted to uppers, things like cocaine and amphetamines. This is important because the kind of substance or behavior that a person becomes addicted to and what that addiction creates for them is a good indication about what the opposing or to the opposite side trauma is or pain is that the person's trying to get relief from. There's one study that I find illustrates the fact that this mental and emotional component to addiction is really where we need to be looking at and is the variable that creates addiction. It was a study that was done with a group of rats. Now, these rats were put in a cage where there was cocaine laced into water. Now, naturally, just like you'd predict, these rats started to obsessively drink the water until they quite literally died. Now, the conclusion is obvious, isn't it? 
there is no amount of cocaine that's safe because obviously the second you taste it, based on the addictive nature of cocaine in and of itself, you will get addicted. Of course, that's what D.A.R.E. program and other ridiculous programs like that would have you believe. But then the unsatisfied researcher changed a variable. Bruce Alexander changed the cage itself. In the original experiment, the rats were in a small cage by themselves with no company, no space, and no toys to play with. In Bruce's new experiment, he constructed a rat park with tunnels and turn wheels, and most importantly, other rats to play with. This time around, none of the rats got hooked on the drug-laced water. The conclusion was that it wasn't the drug that created addicts, but the cage and isolation they were trapped in that drove them to become addicts. What should this tell you? If the necessary ingredients for a person's well-being do not exist, a person is driven to having to cope in certain ways, and addiction is the greatest method for coping with something. It's a behavior that you have noticed repeating creates relief. While specific variables in terms of pain dictates what type of behavior or substance a person will become addicted to, there is a variable that all addicts, without exception, share, whether they are actually realizing it about themselves and acknowledging it or not, and that is loneliness. On top of that, because their well-being or the ingredients necessary for their well-being is not really being met, <laughs> these people are in pain alone. Now, all of you know that the experience of going through addiction doesn't just impact an addict, it impacts everyone in their life. If you are in love with an addict, your life is affected by that addiction. And so, there is a lot of support groups for people who are in relationships with addicts. There's lots of people who give advice about what to do if you're in a relationship with somebody who's addicted. The problem is, is that most of these strategies that they'll give you, including the tough love one especially, only exacerbate the original problem. These tough love strategies for getting a person off of the addiction are not particularly empathetic, meaning you haven't put yourself in the shoes of the person who is addicted and really understood that that addiction, though it may seem harmful to you, to them is in fact their rescue. Now what that does is it puts people in a parallel reality. It means that their reality they're living in is quite separate and different to the reality that you're living in and it makes them more and more isolated, thus fueling the very conditions that are creating the addiction in the very first place. For this reason, if you're suffering from an addiction or know someone who is, I encourage you to watch my video titled The Most Dangerous Parallel Reality. I also encourage you to pick up a copy of my book titled The Anatomy of Loneliness, in which I explain the exact makeup of loneliness, as well as what causes it, and also how to solve it so you can feel connection instead. All that being said, I'm going to make a very bold statement. These emotional conditions and mental conditions that create the addiction in the first place, or the need for the relief from that substance or that behavior in the first place, I should say, on top of the loneliness that is inherent to addiction, is more important than ever focusing on the addiction itself. The addiction whatever the behavior or substance is that a person is addicted to, is in fact a symptom, not the original cause of the issue. And if you focus at it as if it's the cause, you will never solve the addiction. In fact, a person, even if they are going to be capable of getting off of that particular addiction, will simply replace it with a different one. The only truly successful addiction programs are the ones that understand this. They're the ones that understand that unless you deal with that underlying wounding, there is absolutely nothing you can do to get people to a state where they are not addicted to something. So the most successful addiction programs are the ones who focus at the addiction itself as if it is a symptom. The ones that I think are the very best put almost no effort actually into helping a person get off a substance. All the focus is placed on how to heal that underneath wounding. Because what they understand is, is that if a person is using an addiction like a pain medication, if you take care of the original wound so there's no more pain, there really isn't a reason to be using, is there? You have to get rid of the reason to use in order to make it so that the person can let go of these types of behaviors. Now that I have said that, I do need to warn you that the vast majority 
not even some, the vast majority of addiction centers that exist in the world today are complete and total BS. And there are several reasons why, but you do need to know that if you're dealing with addiction or if you know somebody who is. The first reason is that the majority of addiction centers are not actually started by people who are, they themselves, ad educated in addiction. And they are mostly run with outdated ideologies relative to addiction. So many of these centers are not started by people who are in this line of work, but who are businessmen. And these businessmen see a very big opportunity to extort massive amounts of money, not only from individuals themselves, but also insurance companies. Most also do not understand that family and social dynamics outside the center are the single biggest factor for whether somebody is actually going to be able to succeed with their rehabilitation process. That's why there's such a horrible relapse rate, one of the reasons why, when you take a person out of the supportive environment, provided it is supportive, the supportive environment and healthier dynamic that's taking place inside of an addiction center, put them back into their social sphere, and all of the patterns that cause them to use in the first place are reinforced. They fail to recognize addiction recovery as a process that must include family members and friends or a complete change to a person's post-release social setting, otherwise it is Absolutely pointless. But that there is another problem, isn't it? Because if you really look deep into it, there's very little incentive for an addiction center to have somebody recover. In fact, there is a lot of financial incentive for failure. Less than half of the people who enter into rehab programs actually complete rehab, and most who do relapse again. The centers actually benefit financially by blaming this failure on the patient and telling them that they have to come back again. At this point, they can then charge them exorbitant admission fees and charge them to be there in rehab all over again. And this creates the cycle of extortion. Addiction treatment is a bit like the neglected orphan in the overall healthcare system. I know it's really tempting when you're addicted to a substance and see that it's a problem or when you're with somebody who's addicted and you see that it's a problem to make an enemy of the substance or behavior itself. What you're missing is that even if you can see that it is creating a problem for the person or yourself, it is their rescue. That is more than a security blanket. It is quite often the thing that is keeping them emotionally and mentally able to survive. And we have to understand that in order to have the kind of compassion and objective perspective necessary to take the right action steps and to say the right thing. And I'm also going to tell you something. You really don't have a place in the field of healing addiction until you understand that there are levels of pain, mental and emotional and even physical on this planet, that make selling your soul to the devil worth it. When we try to stop a person's addiction to a substance or behavior by making it about stopping the substance or behavior itself without directly addressing the wound they are trying to get relief from through the addiction, we are in fact doing more damage to them and they will relapse or switch to another addiction. In order to overcome addiction of any kind, we have to be willing to go in the exact opposite direction from where we want to go. Now we understand that for a human being, not just a human being, for beings on the planet Earth, it's a natural tendency and a survival tactic to go away from pain. However, if we want to heal addiction, unfortunately, slash fortunately, we have to go straight into it instead. So imagine the addiction in your life, or the pain, I should say, that you're trying to get away from through an addiction is like this giant tornado, and it's been chasing you through your whole life. The only actual way to resolve this addiction, in this analogy, is to stop running from the tornado, turn around, and run straight into it. This can be where it's useful to start reducing, or potentially, depending on where you are, stopping a substance or behavior altogether. Naturally, when you don't use a pain medication, suddenly you feel the pain again, right? So I want you to imagine this. You're in a hospital or somebody's in a hospital, and suddenly you don't give them any more morphine. When they start screaming and yelling, they can point directly to the place where they're in pain. Obviously, by pointing to it, a person is then able to say, Oh, wow, I can now see what the real issue is, and we can directly resolve that issue. This is what has to happen with the healing of addiction. If a person does not engage in the specific addiction, the wounds that a person is trying to avoid with the addiction will begin to start howling, so to speak. 
This makes it much easier to directly become aware of and resolve what is underlying that addictive behavior. Obviously, because there are certain behaviors, and especially certain substances, where <laughs> that process of withdrawing from the actual addiction itself is a lot more serious than others. This should be a step that you are directly prepared for. That being said, I have created a process for doing specifically this. It is called the completion process. If you're interested in learning how to do this process, pick up a copy of my book that is quite literally titled The Completion Process. Or to find a practitioner that can lead you through the process instead, visit www.thecompletionprocess.com. So you can understand what heals addiction, I'm going to tell you a true story. Pat was a professional athlete. In his early life, nothing he could do in his father's eyes was ever good enough. Or that's at least his perception. No matter what he did, he couldn't get that affection and that approval. But the closest he ever got was sports. He noticed that any time he was achieving something, any time he was succeeding or winning, he would get at least some kind of feedback. So he became absolutely desperate for this approval and poured himself into sports more and more until he became a professional athlete. Pat ended up making the Olympic team. But of course, the second that he did that, he started panicking about what might happen if he lost instead of won. Now, What's really interesting about the amount of stress and tension that this put him into is that one month before he actually went to the Olympic Games, he got mono. Now, those of you who understand mono understand how difficult it would be to compete against all of these world-class athletes if you were at such a disadvantage. Long story short, he didn't even come close to making the podium. Now, looking at his life, he realizes, wait a minute. In four years, I'm literally going to be too old to compete, which means that this is the last Olympics that I can ever engage in, which means I will never be a gold medalist, which means my life makes no sense whatsoever, and I will never get what I always wanted from my father. With all of these feelings of feeling insignificant, feeling never good enough, feeling unloved and unvalued, he goes to a party one night. He's got nothing else to do with his time now. It's pretty hard to dedicate yourself to sports. And then all of a sudden, overnight, you have nothing going for you in your life anymore, no purpose and no direction. At this party, somebody starts to crush up a pill, Oxycontin. They go, hey, take a hit. So he decides to snort it. Now what's really interesting is that pretty soon he starts to feel better than he ever has. That tension of never feeling good enough, of feeling insignificant, and all of those things, for the first time in his life, goes away. Long story short, he goes back to do it again. He develops more and more and more of a tolerance. Then the need increases. He eventually runs out of money, has to become a dealer himself just to get his hands on the stuff that he is needing. When he is found stealing money out of his mother's purse one day, they kick him out of the house. After that, he gets put into two different rehab centers, both of which, after exorbitant amounts of money are paid, he ends up relapsing and relapsing and relapsing and relapsing again. When he gets out of these centers, by the way, the reason that that didn't work is because, yet again, these centers don't understand that you've got to actually face the original wounding that is creating that need for the relief in the first place if you want to solve the addiction, but they didn't. So with these relapses over and over and over again, every time he gets let out of these centers, he goes right back into his family home, where yet again he's turned into the family scapegoat, which yet again reinforces the very patterns that are causing him to take Oxy in the first place. Eventually, Pat is led to the understanding that probably he should stop focusing on his addiction to the Oxy itself and start focusing on whatever pain is causing him to want to use in the first place. This means that with the help of a therapist, Pat starts experiencing all of those sensations that he had been trying to avoid. He starts to look directly at all of his feelings of not good enough. He looks at the painful trauma around his father. He starts looking at the insignificance, why he thinks it's there, starts realizing the only reason he went into sports in the first place isn't because he actually likes the sport to begin with. It's because he was always trying to get approval from his dad. Approval he could never get. 
Pat was able to recognize and change social patterns, as well as make deliberate changes to his social group so that he lived with and had people in his life that valued him just for his company instead of for achievement. He was able to experience appreciation for himself instead of shame by clearly seeing that much of what he went through was a projection of his father's, who never actually wanted a child, and whom only liked the personal ego boost of being able to say he had a successful son. Because he had that unconditional connection in other relationships, he was able to let go of needing his father to approve of him. He found a part of himself that loved to succeed because challenging himself to succeed was fun, and no longer simply tried to succeed in order to earn love. Pat now has a family of his own. He's been sober 11 years as a result of all this work he did facing that underlying pain that was motivating the addiction in the first place. If we want to find the cause and also the solution to a person's addictive behavior, we should not be looking at genetic predispositions. We should not be looking at biochemistry. We should not be looking at the substance itself. What we should primarily be looking at is the emotional and mental conditions that were traumatizing, that caused distress in a person's childhood environment. And we should be looking at how those patterns of distress in their childhood environment becomes a pattern that is repeated in their adult life. If you're looking back at your childhood and current life and cannot specifically identify any trauma or emotional pain, you would benefit by watching my video titled Today's Great Epidemic and How to Solve It. You should be looking at and resolving the painful patterns that originated from that childhood environment, but that continue to play out in their adult life with the utmost compassion. In order to understand compassion, you can watch my video titled Compassion and How to Cultivate Compassion. One thing I do need you to understand is that for the human species in general, the single biggest need is connection. It's actually a bigger need than even food or water. You can understand this because when people go through a breakup, they often lose their appetite completely. The reason for this is because we are a relationally dependent species. When we are born, if you put an infant out on the sidewalk, it is dead. Connection is the only way we can get our other needs met. This means that our survival is laced in with connection. If we perceive that becoming aware that our childhood issues were in fact what created this negative addicted state we're in today, what we feel like is that we're going to lose connection with the connections we need the very most regardless of whether those connections are actually there or whether they're in our mind alone. The most carefully guarded thing is our human relationships. Now naturally, if our survival's on the line, we are unlikely to see something. We're more likely to go into denial about it. And so it should come as no surprise to us that it's very difficult for people to identify childhood issues and family trauma as the reason that they're addicted. Because there's skin in the game for realizing that. However, doing so is the only way that you're going to overcome addiction. And I'll help you out in this way. Most of the problem that's making it so that you refuse to look at these factors as the reason for your addiction is because of the fact that you make it mean something. If mom did this thing and it created this negative pattern in me and I notice that and I recognize it and I have to say something like, yeah, my childhood has some issues rather than my childhood was awesome, then I can't have a relationship with mom. Then mom will get mad at me. Then she will ostracize me. Then I will be the scapegoat of the family. There is always a what you're making it mean that is motivating the denial and that denial does have to go if you want to overcome addictions. I'm going to give you your first thought step towards the compassion that is necessary when you are dealing with resolution of addiction now. <sighs> addiction is not a character flaw. It is not a moral issue. The fact that it is possible for someone to be jailed for an addiction, as if addiction implies some sort of character flaw or lack of morals, is something that the future will look back on with complete and total embarrassment. Most people walking the planet today use some kind of compulsive coping mechanism regardless of the fact that it doesn't actually serve them and is in fact a detriment to their life. For this reason, 
We must accept that we are all, in fact, addicts, and there can be no stigma for a condition we all share. The question is, what are you addicted to? Some of us have simply found ways to become addicted and methods that are much more societally accepted than others. Have a good week.